Okay, there's going to be a Ring of Honor classic review of Bitter Friends, Stiffer Enemies. Um, before we get into the show, wanted to touch on what happened on Dynamite. So, um, yeah, they stripped Punk of the title. Uh, they stripped the Elite of the uh, Trios Championships. Um, you know, it's coming out now that Punk actually did injure himself uh, in the match against Moxley. You know, I, I watched the match back. I, I didn't really notice uh, the injury. You did notice Punk holding his elbow. He actually did try to do a push-up with his knuckles uh, during the actual match. So it does make sense that he got injured during the match. Maybe that kind of, you know, trickled down to the press conference where he was in such a, you know, rage of a mood. So yeah, uh, it definitely does suck, and I'll I'll, I'll I'll kind of follow up on the press conference at the end of the video because you know with this show right here, I, I don't know with bitter friends, stiffer enemies. This show, this is probably the angriest I've ever seen Punk on any Ring of Honor show or any show just in general, uh, in, until you got to you know all out 2022 with the aftermath and the press conference and everything so yeah just a um it's just a shame it's a it's a bit bitter it's a blow to the gut a, a bitter pill uh to swallow but uh it is reality uh the good news is cm punk uh is not dead and the other good news is AEW is loaded with talent i thought dynamite was was awesome last night um but yeah let's get right into it okay so Bitter Friends, Stiffer Enemies. This took place in Fear Fairfield, uh, Connecticut at Sacred Heart University. I was actually there a couple years back for a shoot. But um, yeah, man, this was actually at Sacred Heart University on August 16th, 2003. And uh, yeah, definitely one of the better shows of 2003. Arguably one of the best, if not the very best match of 2003. Uh, as well and, and and when you hear the title bitter friends stiffer enemies you always think of homicide and steve carino but i believe they titled this because of low-key and damn off uh you know they they were they're on the cover so you know it's kind of like killing two birds with one stone i think they actually titled bitter friends stiffer enemies too over multiple feuds you know you had davy and roderick and then you had uh steen and, and generico so um it's just it's just the theme of the show as well you know I, I believe Carino and Homicide started out as as a tag team at first and then they became enemies uh, but let's get right down to it first match of the night you had Homicide taking on Prince Nana alright so Homicide wanted to get the thing with Carino out of the way first um, you know just to yeah I, I think they really wanted to sell the fact that you know they couldn't coexist unless they could you know get this fight out of the way you know as soon as the show started and uh, you know Carino only wrestles in the main event, so he didn't come out. So Prince Nana and Homicide have a mess. N Nana actually gets a lot of offense in. He uses his ass as a weapon, and then Homicide puts him away with the STF in a couple of minutes. Really nothing to talk about here. The the, the undercard here, um, there's a lot of matches that I just don't want to spend a lot of time on. All right, next up we have the Purists of John Walters and uh, Tony Mamaluk uh, taking on the ring crew of Don and Marcos. All right, Gabe actually said that they, they cut a couple of matches or cut – cut a couple of minutes off of the match and he didn't he didn't really explain why but he promised that there would be no other editing uh during the show but i think at this time ring of honor heavily edited a lot of matches i, I guess the punk and raven match uh, a couple weeks later was actually edited as well but yeah the purist uh put donna marcos away uh pretty easily uh really nothing uh to go in depth about uh next up we have matt striker taking on bj whitmer uh, the winner of this match would go on to the Field of Honor tournament. This was good stuff. I, I, I got to say, if you want to find an underrated Ring of Honor match that no one remembers and no one ever talks about, uh, this would definitely be it. I, I thought Stryker and BJ uh, busted out some really nice, convincing submission holds, devastating suplexes. They left it all in the ring. Th this, is, this was great stuff between these two guys. Uh, you know, BJ, you know, I, I like BJ Whitmer, but a, a lot of his matchups come off a little bit bland. And the same could be said about Stryker. I mean, you put Matt Stryker in the ring, especially this Matt Stryker. This is a totally different Matt Stryker than the teacher from the WWE. But he's a good technical wrestler. He's a solid dude. But, you know, the problem with Matt Stryker is you just, he, you know, he just didn't scream dollars and cents like, like CM Punk alluded to. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it went to a 15-minute time limit draw. Uh, both guys ended up entering the field of honor or anyway but you know really really good stuff it's not going to resonate with anybody with everybody but it was pretty good you know uh all right next up you have special k the backseat boys the carnage crew and the sat you know you have four you know different tag teams here Th this really feels like 
you know, 2003, it, it almost felt like ECW and RF video more so than Ring of Honor. You know, it, it, it definitely felt like Feinstein was behind more of these, uh, you know, these tag matches or these uh, frays or, you know, these special K, um, what do you call them? Uh, raves, uh, so to say, where, you know, these special K matches that just feel like a whole, it feels like a, um, you know, like a brawl at a, um, at a club, you know, that, that type of feeling to it. But yeah, I, I thought, I thought this was good stuff. I thought the backseat boys, uh, especially Trent Acid looked really, really good. You know, the SATs busted out some really nice things. You know, the Carnage crew, they were like, you know, I wasn't a big fan of the Carnage crew, but, you know, they almost have appealed to a lot of the ECW fans because of their lifestyle and because of, like, their mentality. So it, it was definitely a nice mix. Special K came out and kind of uh, destroyed this thing, but it was really good action uh, while it lasted. I, 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 you know, I really wouldn't sleep on a match like this. You know, you definitely had some good talent out there, especially guys like Trent Acid uh, and the SATs who kind of, you know, brought more of a Lucha style uh, to Ring of Honor at that time. So they follow it up with uh, Alexis Lurie, Mickey James actually taking on Becky. Uh, Becky Bayless, the, um, at that time, she was actually in Special K. You know, she's more of a, uh, she became more of a reporter. But yeah, she wasn't really a wrestler. So Alexis won this thing, um, you know, in, in, maybe under a minute. You know, really nothing to talk about there. All right, next up, yeah, Christopher Daniels taking on Xavier. Um, number one contenders trophy match. All right, so this is Xavier's return to Ring of Honor uh, since he lost to Samoa Joe at Night of Champions 2003. So, you know, it's, it's, Xavier actually gets on the mic and he talks about how, you know, Daniels should lay down for him and, and Xavier should be the leader of the prophecy. And Daniels, you know, fires right back at him and says, if it wasn't for me, you know, you wouldn't have been Ring of Honor champion because I let you become Ring of Honor champion. So, yeah, you know, this was good stuff here. You know, you got two guys in the same stable going up against each other. I thought it felt competitive, very slow paced at certain parts. You know, I actually fell asleep during this match like twice because it was just a little bit slow uh, in the beginning with Xavier working over Daniel's neck. But I got to say, you know, really, really good stuff from Daniel's. Uh, Xavier is a hell of an athlete. I just think at this particular time and even going back to his Ring of Honor title reign, he was just a little bit green. You know, when you compare him to all the guys that won the belt around that time, yeah, the reign is one of the worst. It just doesn't hold up. But he was still a talented wrestler. But uh, yeah, you know, some really, really good high spots at the end of this thing. Daniels probably hit his most impressive best moonsault ever. Xavier gets out of the way. He like hit it in, you know, almost the middle of the ring. Xavier goes for the 450. You know, Daniels kicks out. And then, you know, they try to cheat behind the referee's back. Ultimately, Daniels comes away with this thing, you know, getting more leverage than Xavier. And he goes on to face Samoa Joe at Glory by Honor 2 and gets the, the, uh, the trophy and the number one contender spot. But yeah, good, solid stuff. I, I just I just felt like it had a little bit of pacing issues and, you know, maybe it went a little bit too long. It went like almost 25 minutes. All right, next up you had Deranged, Johnny Storm, uh, Slick Wagner Brown, and uh, Hydro, who's actually Jay Lethal. You know, very young Jay Lethal at this time. You saw him trying to do, uh, you know, uh, a snap suplex very similar to how Chris Benoit does it where he tries to do that snap um so Slick Wagner Brown if you haven't seen this dude um think Shelton Benjamin you know he's really a jacked up black dude with uh with blonde bleached hair you know you almost look like the gold standard version of Shelton Benjamin just a little bit more mus muscular you know you saw him do a lot of topes and high spots this was just you know this is just one of those matches where you come back from intermission and it's just four guys letting them do their thing you could argue that it came off a little bit like it was backyard wrestling but it was fun for what it was it was sloppy at certain points but other other parts of the match you know it was it was pretty good action all right next up we got the non-title match uh, ROH non-title match between Samoa Joe and CM Punk. This is the first, I believe, the first meeting of Joe and Punk ever. Uh, definitely the first time they met in Ring of Honor. So if someone, if someone said, "Yeah, you want to see a classic Joe versus Punk match," and you saw this on uh, YouTube or whatever, you you would come away very disappointed um, because you know it's just it's just nowhere near you know anything from the trilogy. So this is not part of the trilogy, even though this is you know the first time. Joe and Punk have met, you know, uh, to be exact, their trilogy is World Title Classic, Joe vs. Punk 2, All-Star Extravaganza 3. Those wouldn't take place until, you know, the summer of 2004. So we're still a ways away. But, you know, I, I really, you know, with this match right here, you could definitely see the potential. It definitely had, you know, you could definitely tell there was something there between them. 
even though if, if you show this to someone that's never seen them wrestle before, they might come away a little bit empty feeling. But uh, I still thought Punk was really, really good of working over Joe's arm. You know, you saw Joe really annihilate Punk's knees, just kind of chopping the knees, kicking at the knees. Some of the dragon screws that Joe did here just looked very violent. Even his transition into the Boston, the half Boston crab just looked violent, vicious, and just well executed. You know, Punk didn't get a lot of offense in. He, he hit the shining wizard, tried to go for it again, and then Joe just kept on doing leg screws. And yeah, but you could definitely see the the potential for greatness here. And then after the match is over, uh, Daniels comes out and you know kind of uh, sends Joe a message before the Glory by Honor two match that they would have. So, but yeah, I, I really thought this was good stuff. The reason it was non-title is because Punk had a lot on his mind. You know, his, his girlfriend had just got taken out in Dayton. His girlfriend's name was Lucy at the time. And then on top of that. This is Punk's first show back since Death Before Dishonor, where Raven and Tommy Dreamer uh, poured beer uh, down his throat and kind of crucified him to the ring. So, you know, Punk was in a really bad mood uh, throughout this whole show. And uh, I think they wanted to make a non-title, too, because uh, Punk didn't want he didn't want to risk an injury before the Raven match. So that's why he tapped right away. If it was for the title. Obviously, he wouldn't have gave up as quickly as he did with his knees giving out because of uh, Joe's submission. Okay, next up, we got the match of the night, uh, arguably the 2003 match of the year and one of the best feuds in Ring of Honor history. We got Homicide taking on Steve Carino. You know, just like the Briscoes, uh, Stina Generico feud, you know, I, I think this is another case where you could just feel the hatred. I, I think legitimately these guys ended up really hating each other. Um, you, you know, you, you definitely had a lot of real life stuff going on in these matches that made you believe, man, these guys, uh, you know, friggin hate each other. So, you know, this started at the original Glory of Honor. They had a uh, situation where Homicide stabbed him with a the fork. There was a riot at the, the first anniversary show because of, you know, one of their matches, I believe. So, uh, yeah, you know, pretty, you know, without a doubt, you know, one of the bloodiest, one of the uh, most heated feuds ever. And obviously with this match right here, what overshadows everything is Homicide slapped to Carino, where Carino, you know, starts holding his ear. And, you know, there, there's even rumors that he lost his hearing in his right ear because of the slap. So, you know, from my personal experience, uh, I, I kind of know what that feels like. You know, I, I used to have those Beats by Dre headphones. And uh, I, I remember one time my iPod froze and I couldn't shut the volume off. So I just unplugged it, you know, when I was getting on a bus. And then <laughs> and then when I, um, you know, plugged it back in, I forgot I had the volume all the way up. And I, all of a sudden, my ear just felt like it got electrocuted. And, you know, I felt like I was in an airplane the whole day. And it was just, yeah, it's just not a good feeling. It's just, uh, it's, it's hard. Like, you feel like you just don't want to do anything when that happens. So props to Carino. For, you know, feeling what he felt and, and still going out there and delivering a classic. I'll tell you, this match had everything, though. You know, this wasn't like a garbage brawl. I mean, it was um, it was bloody and everything like that. But it just definitely had a flow to it. You know, it gave you everything. It gave you, you know, breathtaking near falls. It gave you, um, you know, barbed wire. You know, the, you saw Carino's, like, you know, skin peeling from the barbed wire. You saw, you know, breathtaking tables, you know, uh, Carino actually doing a pile driver through one of those stiff ass wooden tables, uh, you know, stiff lariats, the tope con hello where homicide goes flying into the crowd. Uh, it, you know, even from even from a visual standpoint, there, there's shots of homicide just looking like for gazed in at the camera with a face full of blood. There's even one there's one shot where homicide looks like he, it looks like a crime scene. It, you know, you, you see the blood flowing out of his head and you see a puddle of blood and, uh, you know, as homicide is, is laying on the puddle of blood. It, lo it looks like he's actually shot to death, uh, f you know, from being shot in the head. I mean, it, it just it just looks incredible. So, yeah, L like I said, guys, uh, Brett taking near falls, pretty, pretty, pretty good ending as well. I mean, the ending could have been a little bit better. It definitely sets up the War of the Wire match. So Homicide actually has Carino locked in the uh, STF and uh, the trainer who Homicide got into a fight with at the beginning of the show, throws the towel. So, yeah, I mean, anytime, you know, you throw in a towel, it, it, it's always, it's, you could definitely argue it's a little bit of a deflating of an ending, but, you know, still good stuff between these guys. This, this was just a war. 
um, and it, it had a, it had a grueling pace to it too. You know, hom Homicide you know went on a tear this year. He has a they actually made a compilation just dedicated to his work in 2003. I believe it's called Homicide 2003 MVP, and obviously this was the best match uh, from his MVP run. Uh, you know, some would even argue the best match of 2003. I, I don't know if I quite say that now. There was a time where this was a top 20 match in Ring of Honor history. I would still say it's top 100, maybe even top 50, and uh, still a still legitimately a top four Ring of Honor match of 2003. Obviously, I'm a huge you know wrestling fan, so I, I'll probably go with guys like Danielson and London uh, over a match like this. But if if you want to tell me that this is the 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 best match of 2003 for Ring of Honor. Um, I have no problem with that. In, in, in a lot of ways, it really fits what Ring of Honor was in 2003. Kind of a blend of, e, you know, the old school ECW with, you know, Robbie Feinstein and RF video. You know, this, this you know, 2003 was not exactly the best time for Ring of Honor. But if you love ECW, I would say that this this was a time for the company that you'll absolutely love. And I think Homicide and Karina really embodied uh, a lot of what ECW would have became uh, had a state in business. All right, next up we have Low Key taking on Damn Moff. All right, so all right, so I, I really I'm a big fan of the punk promos on this show, especially the one to close the show. And 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 I got to remember to talk about it because it, it definitely ties into you know what's going on right now. But uh, yeah, Low Key and Damn Moff. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say you know they they titled the the show after this because it was so stiff. I mean the the stiffness. In the main event is what really sold it. But Damn Moff cuts a promo on the show. That's almost scary. And by the way, this is a show that's not going to appeal to the good-looking girl in school with the pretty eyes and the nice hair and the nice smile. This this has no mainstream appeal at all. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if they pulled this Damn Moff promo from YouTube. It's that hardcore. It's that serious. It's that, you know... It, it's almost too hard for YouTube, but uh, it was a great promo, though. You know, he talked about, you know, the history with him and Loki, how they started off as friends, and then he got jealous of Loki because he started wrestling at Madison Square Garden. Does anyone know when Loki competed at the Garden prior to, to this match? I'd like to know. I think I think that'd be really interesting. Talked about how Loki was the first Ring of Honor champion, all the accolades from Japan, and how Loki, you know, is becoming this legend in professional wrestling. And, you know, Moff came off a little bit jealous. And the, the highlight of the promo was about his 10-year-old daughter. And he actually asked his daughter, who's your favorite wrestler? And then she said, low-key. And it was like the first time in my life I wanted to actually slap my daughter upside the head. <laughs> it was scary to watch. And it was really emotional stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I would definitely say one of the better promos uh, that Ring of Honor had in 2003, that damn Moff promo. Um, yeah, so in terms of the actual match between Moff and Loki, you know, by the end of it, you might find it a little bit, you know, you might feel a little bit gypped uh, because of the ending of it. The ending is probably the highlight of the show. But basically, you know, Loki was, was stiff as hell here. The Mongolian chops are insane. I've never seen Mo I've never seen Loki this stiff with anybody before. The Mongolian chops were awesome. Uh, the bitch slaps from both of them, full contact. Really, really, you know, just breathtaking stuff if you if you like that stiff style. And then, you know, Moff didn't get a lot of offense in. But eventually, Loki goes for a springboard insiguri and just knocks damn Moff out. He, the, the kick goes right to the temple and Moff is just knocked out cold. Uh, it it kind of came, it came off like it was almost a shoot where, where Loki had to pin him because... You know, it was an unexpected knockout. But, you know, because of how low-key was booked at this time with, you know, not wanting to do jobs and just being very, very selective about who he works with, I'm going to assume that this was planned uh, and that's how it came up. But, yeah, pretty memorable main event. I, I do think it's overshadowed by Homicide and Carino. You know, when you think of this show, you think of Homicide and Carino because, you know, I think at one point they were friends and, um you know, b both, both this double main event, you know, it's, it, you could definitely, you could argue that they were, it, they tell the story of friendship and how they became bitter enemies. The title actually kind of reminds me of, um, good friends, better enemies from Shawn Michaels and Kevin Nash, the, the, in your house. It's almost like they stole the title there and kind of gave it uh, a little bit of a twist. So I thought that was pretty creative, but yeah, the show actually ends with, uh, CM Punk trying to find Christopher Daniels and ask him, 
who took out my girlfriend uh, Lucy, and then Christopher Daniels is there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't so, wouldn't be so much worried about who took out your girlfriend in Dayton. I'd be much worried about Raven because Raven, you know, promised that the House of Fun match at beating the odds is going to be the most violent, vicious match he's ever been in, and because it's Raven saying it, it means something. And then it pisses Punk off, and Punk looks at the camera, and he talks about how his dad was an alcoholic, how he came from a broken home. So it just kind of got me thinking, you know, Punk's had a really hard life, you know, it's, and, you know, he probably does have a lot of, you know, severe trust issues, and, and that might kind of play into him being a little bit oversensitive, and, uh, you know, maybe it's a little bit harder to earn his respect and earn his trust you know, to, you know, cutting this promo on Raven. So, yeah, you got to keep in mind, though, Punk is really upset. He's trying to sell the fact that he got, you know, alcohol poured down his throat uh, by by uh, Raven, a washed-up has-been, and he actually called Tommy Dreamer a fat never was. So, yeah, that's a pretty uh, big pill to swallow. But I, I like this Punk promo. He, he came across really angry here. There's also a promo at the beginning of the show where he's just screaming at Rob Feinstein because... You know, I think he actually missed Wrath of the Racket in Dayton when his girlfriend got took out and all chaos uh, broke loose. He said, I missed one Ring of Honor show and everything goes to shit. And he's like, screaming at Feinstein. So I've never seen Punk ever this heated on a Ring of Honor show. You know, there's two different things bothering him. The, the, his girlfriend being attacked and he's trying to sell, you know, Raven, humiliating him at the original Death Before Dishonor with, with the alcohol and all that stuff. So... Yeah, man. I mean, it, it, it really is sad uh, what happened to Punk. Like I said, man, the good news is he's still alive. He's going to come back. He might not come back until Easter. So he tore his triceps uh, in the match with uh, John Moxley. I think, I think I already talked about that at the beginning of the review. But um, yeah, just, just a, a lot of stuff makes a little bit more sense now. You know, I think when a lot of people watched the presser at first, you know, I thought, if I watched this thing in its entirety, it would make that much more sense because I watched Denise's feed first and then I watched the All Elite feed, which had some audio issues. But, you know, they start off with the punk stuff. So it wasn't like the guy asked any questions about Cabana, um, you know, live at the press conference. I'm going to assume it was more of a magazine article interview with Tony Khan. And I guess Khan said no comment. But a lot of it just went over my head. When he first said the words EVP, it, it I didn't... It, I. I didn't really put it together that he meant, you know, executive vice president. I, I thought he was talking about something else. But, you know, I guess looking back on it now, uh, I guess the Young Bucks or Kenny Omega had leaked to one of the reporters that, yeah, one of the reasons why Cabana got fired is, is because of punk, which makes no sense at all. Because, you know, Cabana wrestled at Death Before Dishonor in July. He was on the pre-show. He looked terrible. He looked out of shape. Uh, but punk wasn't back from the injury yet and i guess they let him go shortly after that show so why would punk if punk really wanted to get him fired why didn't they just fire him right away as soon as punk started working for the company so it, it just sucks that you know someone that's not even with the company now that that didn't even make it onto the you know the main show for death before dishonor uh played a part in you know really playing a huge distraction uh, for for such an incredible, you know, what should have been such an incredible weekend from a wrestling standpoint. But, you know, that's the thing that sucks about that. I'm, my mind is like going in, in a million different places right now. But, um, yeah, so I guess Punk is upset about that being leaked to the press. And uh, looking back at it now, it's like, you know, he was already injured. He must have known he already tore his triceps before the press conference. So, so maybe that played into why he was so angry uh, at the situation right there. But yeah, I mean, the Cole Cabana thing. You know, I like Cole Cabana. I really do. I, I think it's a shame that Punk was so negative on him and, uh, you know, almost humiliated him at the press conference. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've had, I've, heard from people I, I can't remember who it was from youtube but either they met cabana at a pwg show or they asked him about pwg and he acted like a dick so so maybe it's true maybe cabana's not a good guy but the bottom line is i do feel like cabana helped punk out a lot especially when you go back to the ring of honor days i know cabana wasn't on this particular show but he really gave punk that guy the play that goofball the playoff of 
you know, you've seen in the movies time and time again, but, but Punk and Cabana uh, were magic together. And, and obviously they were great friends. You know, I've, I've had friends that, um, you know, my friend Lorenzo comes to mind. Like we were really, really good friends. And the friendship that we had doesn't even compare to what Punk and Cabana went through together. So it's a little bit deflating. I, I do feel bad. And in, in a lot of ways, I do feel like if Cole Cabana, God forbid, he ended up dying tomorrow, I do feel like Punk would be the first one at that funeral or to even pay for the funeral. So I don't know. I don't know how to feel about it. I, I just hate it when, you know, money and lawsuits, you know, get in the way of a friendship. And it, it, it just sucks that 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 happened between them because of the, the doctor and the mount, you know, uh, defamation of character with the podcast and all that stuff. But um, yeah, but, you know, I, I'm not taking anybody's side, though. You know, I do feel bad for Punk because of the injury and because of, uh, you know, all, all you know, everything that was going on at the press conference with everyone tr trying to, you know, ask all these dirty questions. And, you know, the um, the elite guys, Kenny Omega, you know, the Young Bucks, you know, Hangman Page. Uh, obviously, I think, you know, the, the Bucks are sticking up for their guy, Hangman. I, a lot of it, I think, still has to do with Cody. I, th I think, you know, they probably have the mindset if, if they didn't spend all that money on Punk, maybe they would still have Cody. You know, maybe that's the mentality of well. Maybe that maybe that's real as well. But uh, but I, I do think Punk is a better fit for AEW. I think Cody is a better fit for WWE. You know, I just hope that they can work this out eventually. I, I, you know, the, the worst case scenario would be if, you know, anyone ends up getting killed over this. But this is not, you know, the 90s and this is not, you know, the world of hip hop. So I, I do not see that happening. Uh, you know, the worst thing, the worst thing that would happen is uh, if if guys were forced out, you know, to leave the company over this. But hopefully they could work through it. If anything, you know, the, the real life tension, uh, you know, hopefully they can use it in a way where, you know, they could work together and, and uh, you know, turn it into a positive. You know, hopefully that does happen. But, you know, the injury uh, does suck. You know, Easter, WrestleMania season, when Punk ever does come back, it feels like a long time away. Apparently, he's going to be out for eight months. Uh, and, and, and that really does suck. But I'll tell you what, guys, like this championship reign for Punk or this win for Punk, this has got to be the most negative title win I've ever seen maybe since Montreal and and it, and it just sucks that that such a great weekend you could definitely argue that this past weekend was better than WrestleMania weekend with Clash at the Castle and All Out I, I think both shows ended up being great um, but I think I think when you look back at this everybody's going to talk about uh, you know the punk injury and 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 the uh, and and the fight and the press conference and everything is going to be overshadowed by what happened and and that really does suck but um Like I said, guys, I thought Dynamite was great. You know, Danison and Hangman had an awesome match. A lot shorter than their previous matches, but they packed in a lot of action in the 20 minutes. Their, their chemistry is just insane. The transitions into the into the um, the Dead Eye I thought were great. Uh, so Danielson ends up uh, winning, and who knows? Maybe Danielson might end up becoming champion. I don't think it's the way you envisioned it being. But uh, yeah, you know, you, the silver lining out of all of this is you might get Brian Danielson as champion. And, you know, Danison is really not bothered by a lot of the stuff that Punk is bothered by. So, yeah, you know, you have that to look forward to. It's not ideal. I, I, I you know, I, I love Punk, man. I, I wanted to see, I, even though, I, you know, maybe I sound a little bit too negative on Punk during the review. I, I still wanted this Punk reign to, to work out, you know, probably more than anybody, you know, because he... You know, he's a Ring of Honor guy, and you you know what he can bring to the table. I was really excited, you know, to, to see it happen at Double or Nothing and, and All Out. Like, it just, it's just the most fucked up thing in the world. Two different title reigns, two different times you have to take the belt off of him. So it's, um, I, I don't think we've ever seen anything, you know, quite like this. But um, also thought... <laughs> yeah, I know this is going all over the place. But yeah, the, the Brian Danielson put in the pure championship around Daniel Garcia. Garcia and Yuta had another great match for the pure title last night. It was probably even better than the Death Before Dishonor match. I thought it was cool how Westside Gunn and the Griselda guys, they're actually from Buffalo, so they celebrated, you know, 
um, their guy Garcia from Buffalo, you know, winning the pure title. I thought I thought it was a great main event. Plus, uh, Pac and the Lucha Brothers Death Triangle are the trios champions. That was another really good match. So yeah, that, 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 that's the thing. Like for as much talent as gets suspended over this, that they lose over this, you, you still have so much talent on this. Um, on this roster that, you know, you could definitely make up for it. So, yeah, really looking forward to the Grand Slam. I would assume that it probably end up being Brian and Moxley for the belt. You know, Moxley actually won the last match between them, and Danielson will win this thing. So, uh, so we'll definitely see what happens. But, uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's not the end of the road. Hopefully they can recover from this. I feel, I feel bad for Punk. Um yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people just assumed. Someone actually said he tore his pec during the fight, but accurately, he tore his tricep during the match with Moxley. And looking back on it now, you could definitely see something did happen. It definitely does suck. I think I spent a, enough time uh, talking about it. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'll just leave you with this. It's just a shame that such a great wrestling weekend is just overshadowed by um, all this drama. But, uh, yeah, the real winners is everybody that loves to cash in on these backstage politics, this backstage wrestling drama. And uh, yeah, I'm sure everyone is going to make a fortune, but I'll do the opposite. I'll, I'll drop a old school Ring of Honor video to talk about it uh, that no one's going to watch. So, But it's cool, man. Check out Bitter Friends, Stiffer Enemies. Hell of a show from Ring of Honor from 2003. It's not my favorite era of Ring of Honor, but this really does embody what Ring of Honor was all about in 2003. And without a doubt, this is this is the most angry and the most tension I think you'll ever see out of CM Punk. And uh, don't sleep on Danny Moff and Loki either. They had a very stiff main event, and, and Moff uh, probably cut the promo of his life uh, on this show as well. So that's Bitter Friends, Stiffer Enemies. Hope you guys enjoyed the uh, review, and I'm out. All right.